everyone and welcome uh, to today's weekly uh, Wolf College of Coffee vlog and my name is Peter uh, and today we're going to be answering some of your questions that have come in over the last sort of weeks and months uh, and my first question I uh, would be uh, will be answering is from a, um, from NZ Fingerprint uh, and NZ Fingerprint writes um, can you make a coffee uh, more fruity um, and is that sort of really more dependent around the origin or, de or the variety well, the, the, I guess uh, NZ Fingerprint, the, the general rule of thumb is that the green coffee or the raw material that we're working with, we need to think that that um, has the predefined range of flavour experience that's, that's in that, and that's due to obviously partly the processing method, the varietal, the terroir. Um, and so, you know, if we're buying, for example, um, a lovely natural processed coffee from Brazil, you know, the expectation for that coffee is it's going to be, you know, very rich, uh, dry chocolates, um, perhaps a little bit of red fruit sort of in there, um, but we're really looking for that really sort of chocolatey, nutty kind of coffee. And it doesn't really inherently have this really kind of heavy fruit quality to it. Uh, on the other side of it, um, you know, if we were buying a natural processed coffee from Ethiopia, then the expectation would be, yeah, lots of this real fruit forward style kind of coffee, you know, lots of berries, you know, um, passion fruits, mangoes, so, you know, that real sort of, you know, bowl of fruit. So um, you can only roast what's in there. And so your job as a coffee roaster is to sort of develop um, and enhance or augment um, basically the inherent properties of the green coffee. I mean areas that you would be possibly looking at, uh, what I would be looking at uh, when, when roasting the coffee, uh, particularly to try and retain the highest level of fruitiness that I could, I'd certainly be working on a very short roast development time of generally around about 20 or 21%. This is for espresso roasted coffee. Um, I would also be trying to keep my degree of caramelization, you know, as low as possibly, you know, try and keep that fairly low. Um, and remembering, you know, uh, the, you know, on previous episodes we spoke about, you know, where, where, you know, where is the first crack temperature and where is the second crack temperature. And so these sort of represent the two outer lying markers. And so if we can find that temperature point of first crack and let's just keep the mass really simple and let's just say that that's 100 degrees Celsius and second crack is at say 200 degrees Celsius, then the halfway point would be 150 degrees Celsius and this would represent sort of the midpoint roast. So I certainly encourage everyone out there to understand uh, what their first crack temperature is and what their second crack temperature is and then find that medium, that middle, that middle ground, so average that, that difference out and that would be a medium roast. I'd be aiming to keep my uh, degree of caramelization under a medium roast. So that's just a little bit of a small help. I hope that's uh, been some help for you, NZ Fingerprint. Okay, my next question comes from Stu uh, Loudon and he uh, wants to know whether or not the ultraviolet light would be helpful in either identifying um, Quakers, either in its green format or in post roast. Uh, the simple answer to that question is Stu, no, uh, it won't. Uh, what the, the UV light is particularly good at detecting is over fermentation. Um, and it's really looking at, um, at, at highlighting or basically identifying that sort of bacterial spoilage that sits within the coffee. Remembering that a Quaker is basically a coffee cherry that's been picked under ripe or green and the reason why that we don't, it doesn't, you know, sort of brown or turn brown um, is that it has not the presence of a lot of sugar. Um, and so this is where we get this sort of pale kind of colour. They are, as you all know, very obvious. Uh, in your roasted coffee um, and that's where you get to see them um, and so they are a very difficult coffee to, to identify in green uh, and the natural process um, because we don't have a water separation uh, in, uh, in terms of flotation during a natural process coffee we tend to find this is one of the reasons why we see more Quakers appearing in natural process coffees. Hope that's been uh, helpful to your answer. No pain no gain writes to me which material is best for uh, a roasting uh, roasting drum. Well, I guess you have to look at the coffee roaster as in a very holistic sort of manner. Uh, and so uh, each manufacturer and each sort of builder has their own sort of philosophies around why we would use certain types of materials. But the key thing is to also look at uh, whether the coffee roaster is using a direct heating method or an indirect heating method. And if you're not sure what that means, simply basically direct heating means that the flame 
from, that's, from the burner is touching the outer surface of the drum, so there's a direct contact. And indirect would generally mean that the, the flame or the heat source is either at the bottom or lowered, or it's actually, it's not physically touching the drum in any way, so the, the heat or the hot air is reaching the drum in an indirect sort of method. So with direct method, uh, typically, I would always be uh, would always be more comfortable with a double drum, so an outer drum and an in, and an inner drum. So the outer drum obviously takes that first initial impact. It's that air gap that runs between the inside drum and the outside drum uh, that really provides that cushioning, but also that heat distribution that allows that the impact from the outside to distribute and cushion evenly onto the inside drum, uh, therefore allowing you to transfer that conductive heat uh, into that, that particular inner drum material uh, very evenly and very effectively. Uh, so that would be certainly something I would be wanting to look at. For materials, for example, that if we're using, for example, stainless steel, we know this is a very reactive uh, metal, and so we know when we add heat to this, it heats up very quickly uh, and it cools down very quickly. One of the things uh, that we need to be focusing on uh, with this type of material that's used in a drum, it really does sort of suit more of the indirect uh, uh, heating method, um, but also using lo a lot more sort of airflow control and particularly um, burners that have, um, have high degree of modulation or a very good sort of turn down capacity makes that sort of setup really sort of um, appropriate for a stainless steel drum. Also perforated drums, I would also say that the indirect method uh, would suit a perforated drum more so than the direct method. So that's just a quick sort of explanation. We tend to find um, that most solid drum roasters today would be made from mild steel or blue steel uh, with the front plates either being of the same material uh, or cast iron and that would be the most common I guess materials used within uh, those direct heating models uh, and then with the indirect heating models we definitely see that sort of stainless steel uh, seems to be the more popular um, material of, of, of choice for some of the light sort of metals as well also making their way into the, the construction of the roaster. So I hope that's uh, been uh, been helpful in, in answering your question. I have a question um, for Madeline Anderson and she wants to know uh, which is the best way uh, to clean our probes. Um, do we use rubbing alcohol or anything like that? Um, I guess for us, uh, Madeline, we just really uh, take the probe out and remembering it's at the very tip of our probe here uh, is really where the point of measurement, uh, sorry, where, where, yeah, where the measurement area is for, uh, for roasting. Um, so the actual shaft itself or the length of the shaft doesn't really come into play in terms of it, its, um, its measurement. We just simply use um, a, a, a nylon scourer and we just give it a light little sort of rub over. Um, we obviously clean the shaft and everything else while we're there um, and then obviously make sure that we reposition it back into sort of the, as close to the exact position as possible. We normally mark it off with a little bit of black pen before we pull uh, the the temperature probe out so obviously we can relocate it in um, a lot easier. So nothing really special for the probes, um, just a bit of a light scour, a little bit of a light sort of nylon scour and that should be able to get any sort of build up that we have uh, off the top of those. So I hope that's been, uh, been a help to you as well. My final question comes from Hardy Widodo and Hardy is asking uh, how, what is our approach to sort of roasting for filter coffee but more specifically the treatment of the Maillard phase. Well, for us, uh, we do roast separately here for filter coffee here at Wolf, uh, we, and we do have a slightly different, a very different approach to roasting for espresso. Uh, our, our, our approach to sort of uh, filter is, is fairly simple. Um, some of the key things that we do is that we would be using a very short sort of Maillard phase is what we would be focusing on. So for the time between sort of yellowing and first crack, we're trying to spend, we're trying to reduce our amount of time through that. Uh, the reasons being is we know through uh, shortening this time in the Maillard phase that we get high degree of clarity. So really easy identified flavors. We get really clean, a really clean sort of flavor to the coffee. Uh, but also we get a really lovely sort of um, uh, sort of body to it and we're really trying to focus on that really kind of light um, 
to medium sort of body to it. And particularly when we're sort of working with sort of washed coffees, and when we're working with some of our naturals, you know, by and large, we, we, we you know, we, we, we would sort of maybe just stretch that Maillard reaction out just a little bit, that time in that Maillard reaction just a little bit longer. Um, and what we would do is then um, look to sort of maybe increase sort of that sort of uh, molecular weight of the coffee and, and sort of make it a little bit more syrupy. One of the key things is you know, with filter coffee for us is that we at, we're very aggressive with the heat energy at the start of the roast. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is put lots of, you know, we're really trying to pressurise the coffee, um, get that high sort of molecular binding kind of happening at the start. Um, and then when we get to the yellowing phase, you know, we will, re we will hold the burner slightly. So as we get to the yellowing phase, we will wait a period of time beyond that. And typically speaking for us, we set a temperature because it's really easy uh, to always work from a temperature. So, um, so if you understand what your yellowing temperature is, which we know is a temperature dependent event within your roaster, uh, so let's say for argument's sake that that's 161 degrees Celsius, then for us, for example, we may wait till 167 degrees um, before we start reducing, making our first kind of initial change to the burner uh, from when we first drop the coffee into it. And so therefore we're kind of adding a lot more momentum through uh, that sort of yellowing phase. It does take a little bit of teaking around for your roaster, but that's kind of the principle. Um, that we would be wanting to do to shorten the time between yellowing and first crack. When we do hit first crack, um, we basically take um, uh, we take the burner down to down to either, to zero or very low, depending on which roaster that we're using. Um, we add lots of air into the coffee, um, and so what we're trying to now do is uh, no, normally focus on a roast development time of between 11 and 13 percent, typically. Uh, it seems to work well for us. Some coffees are more 13 and we have some coffees that have done, we've had to take them a little bit further up to 15, but typically speaking we find the average is between 11 and 13%. And we're really trying to focus on uh, short development time because we really want to keep the acid in the coffee, uh, lots of acidity, but we're trying to make sure that we have no greeniness or grassiness in it. And that's where you're going to have to play around with the total, uh, the total time of the coffee. So you would then have to look at um, if you were cupping your coffee up and finding that it was a little green and underdeveloped, then you would need to look at increasing the total roast time to see if you could uh, take some of that flavour out. And then also looking at trying to keep the coffees and temperatures to degree of caramelisation um, as low as possible, because we're really, for us, we really like focusing on that real sort of confectionery sweet sort of sugar flavour. That's our, that, I guess that's our sort of style. Other people have other ideas on that and that's okay too. So that's a little bit of a snapshot on what we sort of focus on for, for our um, roasting for filter. Uh, I know we are planning on doing some live roasting sessions later this year where we'll be actually doing some filter coffee roastings and some of our espresso roasts live. Um, we will be roasting them on our little one kilo probatino uh, and we'll be using both Artisan and Cropster uh, on both of those uh, just for those people out there that have uh, different platforms that they use. Um, but keep the questions coming. We certainly enjoy uh, reading your questions and, and sharing our knowledge and information. I trust uh, this information uh, finds you well wherever you are in the world. Thank you again for watching. Uh, please spread the word and uh, continue to keep subscribing. Uh, it certainly uh, fuels myself and the team here uh, at Wolf Coffee Roasters. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching this week's Wolf College of Coffee vlog. If you'd like to watch another video, you can click one of them here. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe so you can always see the next video when it comes out next week. If you'd like to leave a comment or like below, we'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, grab a cup of coffee and come back soon. I can wait.